All right, thank you so much to everyone for joining. Um, so this is the IMAP basis monthly webinar for September, and today we'll be talking about what's new to IMAP. And so today we'll hear from myself, Mitchell O'Neill, with the New York IMAP basis team, and also several other team members, so John Marino, Jennifer Dean, William McCall, and Meg Wilkinson. And uh, people can please feel free to enter any questions you have into the chat box. Um, and we'll be happy to go through those as we go through the webinar. So for anyone new to IMAP Invasive, it's the centralized invasive species database to support prisms, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. Um, in New York, it's administered by the New York Natural Heritage Program. And um, some of the things you can do in IMAP are you can look at species distributions, you can set up email alerts, you can use the web map services to make web maps, and you can track control efforts and results. And so today, uh, we'll be talking about what's new uh, for 2022. Um, so there have been a lot of minor updates. For instance, um, there's a lot of more help text in IMAP. You can look for that little eye in a circle anywhere on the interface. Um, we did some updates to the symbology. Uh, there's a new update for confirmers where your name will often populate when you confirm records. Um, but those are some of the more minor updates. We're going to focus today's webinar on some of the bigger stuff, like new functionality. So, for example, we're going to talk about the site time series, which lets you view change over time. We're going to talk about new options in the filter tool, doing iNaturalist data. And we're also going to give an update on the species tiers. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you for everyone. Uh, th yeah, thank you to everyone. A lot of this, a lot of the new functionalities have come from user feedback. Um, so we thank everyone for who helped us get to where we are today. And so for the first um, IMAP update, uh, we're going to hear from John Reno, and he's going to showcase the site time series tool. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Mitch. Um, so uh, this is a new uh, piece of functionality that has been added to the map interface on IMAP. And the general intent of it is to show the change in species distributions over time. Um, so you know, there's essentially what appears to be a time slider, we call it, and um, this will move across and as, as it progresses, indicating there's, you know, uh, different, you know, as time goes on, what you'll see in the map is reflecting the uh, data at that point in time. And uh, essentially, it it, this is sort of a version one, and right now it really works best uh, when viewing data at what we say is like a site level, which is basically county or closer um, uh, for the time being. So fortunately at the moment it does not uh, work at the hexagon level, but um, it's still very powerful for uh, many of the layers that you see in IMAP. So just as an example on the right side, um, this uh, screenshot is from uh, the, using the site time series to show the change in hemolocally adelgid uh, in Lake George uh, with recent detections. Um, and so this is just sort of one example of uh, how you might use the site time series. So the general uh, way to use it uh, would be to go to the IMAP uh, interface and then zoom in again to roughly county level uh, or closer. Then we recommend filtering the data generally to you know one species of interest. Um, technically, you don't have to apply a filter, but uh, it, it's you know most it's probably best if you do uh, have it filtered to some criteria that will you know show you that that change. Then uh, in the top right of the map, you will find the site time series button. So you'll just click on that. And then that'll open on the bottom, the site time series panel. And from here, you can change a variety of settings, such as uh, time interval. You can have it display uh, in 
by year or by month. Uh, as well as uh, different uh, modes of displaying the data, which I won't really get into too much detail. We generally, you know, recommend you leave it at the default unless you're doing some sort of advanced type of thing. And then uh, you can specify a start and end date uh, that will uh, the, the time series will cover. Then I simply just press the play button at the bottom left of the tool. And then you should see the, the data start to uh, change based on the position of that uh, of the time series. One quick tip, if you're having trouble viewing the map once you're playing the time animation, uh, we recommend um, one of two things. You can either collapse all of the panels, like this here is the settings panel, you can collapse that, or you can actually entirely close out of the site time series, uh, and it will actually continue running in the background. So um, that, that's a helpful uh, tip. So uh, some other quick notes. Um, again, we do recommend zooming in county level or closer. Um, the other thing we recommend uh, checking the about section of the time series tool, which is uh, this little uh, panel at the top. And that's actually going to tell you what layers are included in your time animation. Most of the layers should work. Um, however, there's a one caveat is um, at the moment there's a, a bug where right now you do actually have to be signed out to use this, but uh, starting tomorrow that should issue should be resolved. Um, and once that is resolved, any layers that you have the permission to view should work uh, in the site time series tool. And finally, uh, the uh, web map service layers are actually now time enabled, and so that actually will work, uh, uh, and that will allow you to do some advanced um, time animations if you're using the web map services as well. So just a, another bonus there. All right, so just uh, to bring this all together and show sort of what it looks like, um, I have provided a screen recording here. So let's go ahead and play that. And this will show uh, basically what I just mentioned of all the, the instructions for, for using this. So what we're looking at here is a uh, spotted lanternfly. And I have filtered the map for spotted lanternfly. And now I'm going ahead and opening the site time series tool. You'll note that um, I have set my extent to uh, 2019 to present, and I'm also uh, snapping by uh, month. So I'll go ahead and keep playing this uh, video, and we'll see that those are the parameters that I've set. And at this point, I would go ahead and just press the play button. And so now we're here in 2019, and we see oh, maybe one or two detections of spotted lantern fly. Um, but as time moves on, now we're moving into, uh, you can see the time ticking down at the bottom. Uh, we're now into the summer of 2020, and we're starting to see more detections uh, in New York City metro area. And now we're already moving right along into uh, summer of 2021. And now, uh, which is when really there was a, a great number of increase in observations. Um, and so those started expanding. Uh, points on the map, and then finally now we're pretty much up to present day. So this is just, you know, one example of, of how you might might use this tool. And lastly, I'll just show this also can be used for uh, more uh, uh, looking at back data. And uh, so what we're looking at here is water chestnut spread in the capital region of New York uh, from 19, the 1930s to present. So um, here it is in 1933, and uh, we just have a few approximate records, and then the one um, known historic site in Scotia, is that correct? Um, and then we click through to 1950, not a whole lot of new records, a few more approximate. Um, then getting up to 1990, now we're seeing some more records in Rensselaer County and other locations. Then in 2010, um, even more detections um, around the time IMAP started rolling out. And then 2022, um, now we have even more data. And so some of this may be, you know, 
more surveying and that sort of thing. So this also, I think, highlights some of the role of, of not detected data as well um, and, and looking at that over time too. So I think that's uh, pretty much it for now for the site time series. Now it's pretty quick, but we've got a lot of other stuff to cover. Um, so feel free if you have questions, uh, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and I'll try to respond and otherwise I'll pass it back to Mitch. Thank you, John. Yes, I'll, I'll start talking about the filter tool, but again, feel free to enter any questions you have about the site time series. Easy. Uh, so just to start, I just want to mention that the filter records tool is part of the two main things you need to do to view data in IMAP, the two things to keep in mind. So one is which layers you have turned on and off. So if you want to look at presence versus not detected versus treatment, you do that in layers on off. And then to filter what records you're seeing from those layers, you use the filter tool, for instance, to filter on a species. So the way that it works in general is by default, you'll log in and you'll see um, unfiltered data. So you'll see a map with confirmed presences for any species. Then you can set a filter, say for black swallowwort in New York State. And then you'll have a filter map. And so you can see in the image on the right, it's a species distribution map for black swallowwort. And just to, to start with the basics, um, to show you what the filter records tool looks like when you're not logged in, it's pretty similar to what the filter, filter record tool has looked like for the past few years. Um, so the filter records button is at the top. You can click on it and uh, see this pop-up box. One thing to point out is this helpful text at the top, which reminds you what the filter is being applied on. Um, so this is a good reminder to check the layers on off. So for instance, if you wanna be filtering the presence data, you need to make sure that the presence data is turned on. Um, and it also mentions, or no, mention that after. Um, and so at the bottom, you can put the apply filter button. Once you've applied a filter, you can clear it if you want to start over. And you can also uh, click on the filter records help link for more information. Um, and I did also want to just point out that if you don't know whether or not you have a filter applied, you can check the button at the top. It will have, the little filter icon will be green if you have a filter applied. So that's kind of the basics, but what I'll talk about mostly today is the, the main update which is that we now have, in addition to the general tab, we now have these new tabs to filter on more things for uh, specific to certain layers. So we have the general tab, and now we also have the presence tab, treatment, not detected, record IDs, geography, and metadata. So I'll go through each of these tabs. Um, so I'll start with general. Um, and again, I'll point out on the top, it tells you what that, what that what the filter can be applied to for that tab. So for the general tab, it can be applied to all the IMAP layers. Um, and it also mentions that the green bordered boxes, so species name and date, um, those will also be applied to the iNaturalist layer. And so Jen will talk about that more later on. So first thing I'll point out on the general records, or on the general tab of the filter tool, is this quick toggle to filter on your own records. If you want a quick map of just the data you've collected, you can also search an observer's name. Uh, the most common thing to filter on would be the species name. Uh, so you can click that drop down and pick out the species you want to view data for. I will note that by default, it will be the New York, or it'll be the species list for your, your home jurisdiction, so your state or province. Um, but you can toggle to the network-wide species list if you would like. And below that, there are some filters for more advanced species attributes. For instance, if you want to look at just animals or plants, or more specifically aquatic plants, something like that. Um, for instance, you can select from habitat type, aquatic, terrestrial, semi-aquatic, and marine. Uh, the one caveat I'll give here is for genus. This is using the network species list genus. So in most cases, that will be the same genus that you're familiar with, with your state or province's list. 
Um, but in some cases, when uh, like taxonomies update, um, you might occasionally, in some cases, uh, see that for this, for the genus, the filter on genus, you'll need to use an older genus name. So that's just something to be aware of for some species. Um, for the filtering on date, uh, in the general tab, this is referring to the observation date. So if you enter a record today, uh, which is actually an observation from two weeks ago or two years ago, um, if you want to filter on it, you'll, you'll need to think about what is the observation date, not the date that you entered it in. And another note on the date is that the filter will include records entered in between the dates that you entered, but it will actually exclude the actual date that you have put in one of the boxes. So for example, if you want to see all the records for 2021, um, you'll need to set records after as the last day before 2021, so December 31st, 2020. And for records before, you'll have to enter in the first day after your desired date, date range. So January 1st, 2022, the day after the end of 2021. And you can also filter on organizations and projects. That's one of the uh, main benefits to using organizations and projects. You can very easily look at data uh, for your group by using the organization and project filters. And jurisdiction always means state or province in IMAP basis. So that's the general tab. Um, now I'll go through each of the new tabs. So for presence, um, again, it gives you a note that it will be applied to the presence layers. So that would be the three presence layers in IMAP, confirmed, uh, unconfirmed, or approximate. And I'll point out two things here that would be useful, particularly to confirmers. So you can filter on records that have photos, because um, those would be the ones that you can, that confirmers can review whether they're correct based on the photograph. And also, if you're a confirmer, you can filter the map on all the records you've confirmed. For instance, if you want to include how many records you've confirmed in a quarterly report or something like that. And so then the next tab is the treatment tab. And of course, that is uh, only applied to treatment. So make sure you have the treatment layer turned on. Um, one note on the date. If you want to filter on the starting date for a treatment, you can just use the general tab. Um, but on the treatment tab, you can filter on the end date. And I'll also mention that if you are an organization administrator, you'll have some extra options to filter on in the treatment tab. Next tab is the not detected. Um, so you can filter on some not detected specific fields. Here I'll point out that little I in a circle that I mentioned earlier. Um, you, you'll see those throughout the interface. Um, it means that there's some help text or definition that you can view. So for example, if you don't know what presumed eliminated means in IMAP, then you can hover over that little I and it'll give you a definition. The next tab is the record IDs tab. So all records in IMAP get assigned a unique ID. Um, there are also IDs for species. And so most people won't need to use this tab, but there are some advanced use cases. So one example would be for anyone who has email alerts, you might be used to getting emails with tables of records. And one of the things in that table is the record ID. Um, so if you take those record IDs and paste them into this box here, um, comma separated, um, and then click a apply filter, then you'll be able to, you'll have a map of all the records in your most recent email alert, if that's helpful. Um, but again, uh, it, it's really for advanced use cases um, with this tab. The next tab is geography. For instance, if you want to view just the records in your lake or in your county, and it mentions what uh, the help text mentions which layers that will apply on, and so it's any of the IMAP layers in this case. Um, and then the last tab is the metadata tab. So I was talking about observation date versus creation date before. If you if you want to filter based on when records were entered into IMAP, um, you can use the created after and created before filters. 
Um, and there's also other options like who entered it and um, entry method and last updated. And so I just wanted to finish with two take home messages. Um, one is to always pay attention to the tab you're in and the little help text. Um, use that as a reminder to make sure that the layers you're trying to filter are turned on. And then my second take home is, so the filter tool is really useful for visualization. Um, it's very powerful for visualization, but a lot of the power also comes from the fact that other functions in IMAP can respond to that filter. So for example, the distribution layers work with the filter. So if you want to create a distribution layer for black swallowwort by county, you can filter on black swallowwort and then use the distribution layers option to create a county map. Um, the site time series works with the filter. Report can work with the filter. So you could do a report of the records submitted by your organization for a certain year um, to get a summary of the data you collected. Um, and exports can also adhere to a filter. And so that's uh, all I have for the filter tool, but feel free to enter any questions into the chat and I'll pass it over to Jen. Great, thanks Mitch. And hi everyone, I'm Jen Dean. I'm the uh, invasive species biologist for the crew. And I'm gonna be the one that's bold enough to try to do a live demo <laughs> during this part. So, um, and actually I've kind of, I was playing around just now. Um, it's, you know, it, IMAP can be a little slow sometimes when there's lots of users hitting it. So um, as I'm going through, if you're in IMAP, maybe just take your fingers off the keys for a little bit and, and I'll go through my demo. And then once I'm done, everyone else is back to PowerPoint so you can get back in there. But when IMAP's being used across the country and like during the workday, sometimes it can really bog down. All right, great. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, tell you a little about some of the some of the exciting new things we have with using iNaturalist data within the IMAP invasive system, which is really exciting. And I, I think many of you are familiar with iNaturalist, not all of you are, but iNaturalist is an observation database for any type of species, whether it's invasive, native, rare. Um, anyone can go and take a photo of any species they find anywhere in the world and submit it to the iNaturalist database. And it, you know, produces, it has millions and millions of records every year. Um, so it's a really big citizen science, global citizen science project in a sense. Um, they also have some cool features with um, where they've tapped into machine learning to help suggest the identification of your species. Um, you know, as with everything, please use that with caution. You get that identification and then, you know, go ahead and check that with other sources and such. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of great use of iNaturalist. And there's also a lot of invasive species coming in through iNaturalist that, you know, the submitter might not even know is invasive. And so we have found over the last few years that it's been important to, to um, tap into that database to find some reports of new species, like especially spotted lanternfly. It's been very big um, for finding um, spotted lanternfly records and so forth. All right. So when you first zoom into IMAP, you do see that big cluster of um, of the those hexagon, those orange hexagons showing, you know, observations for all 500 species that we're tracking um, until you start filtering, like using the filters that Mitch mentioned, which are very powerful. Um, and if I go to, so over on my uh, right hand side here, this is our table of contents for the map, and there's lots of layers you can turn off and on. Um, this layers on off component shows you that currently we have the hex layer turned on for that's for all the presence records for confirmed um, you can turn on the unconfirmed data and so forth and now we have an option for turning on the iNaturalist data but you'll notice when i'm zoomed out at the state level this iNaturalist toggle to turn that layer on is grayed out um, and that's because there like i said there's millions and millions and millions of records coming in every year through iNaturalist if we tried to show all of that it would just crash our system completely. Um, so the programmers for IMAP have implemented uh, a zoom threshold so you can zoom in um, to a certain extent and then the iNaturalist toggle will be showing or you can also search by species. And so I'm gonna go ahead and filter 
four species. I'm going to do some Lacoilia belges. And then I apply filter. And so here, you know, I just have the IMAP data turned on. You can see where the IMAP reports, especially in New York, where IMAP is used heavily, um, are showing up. But now my, my iNaturalist option is no longer grayed out. So I can turn that on and bam, all of a sudden you get um, the, un the reports to iNaturalist across the Northeast for, um, for Hemlock Willia adelgid. And you can, um, you can show the legend. So it's, it's showing that those pink diamonds are the, the iNaturalist um, records and then the orange ones are those IMAP records. Um, so this is really helpful at looking at those data gaps and like looking at areas surrounding, say, New York State or surrounding areas that are not using IMAP invasives as their primary database. You can get, you know, a better sense of the general distribution of those species. Um, so I'm going to go search by another species that's not quite as widespread. So um, Italian, uh, Italian Arum. So this is an ornamental that's been shown to be escaping in some parts um, in New York City. And you can see we're kind of on the, the northern range of that species, except for there are a few iNaturalist reports that are popping up or that are showing in their database for say Buffalo and um, kind of like the Utica area. So this is a good point for me to bring up one caveat with the iNaturalist data is that even though there's a field where a user can say whether this is an intentional garden planting versus this is escape into the wild, not many people use it. And so, you know, these could very well be someone's backyard garden plantings. And so I do, I do stress that whenever you're using the iNaturalist data, you go and you actually investigate those records um, within the iNaturalist database. And I'll show you how to do that. Here, I'm going to zoom in to the New York City area. Um, because we do know that there's some escape populations down there. And let's see if I zoom in one more time, we'll, it'll turn on. So now you can see that those hexes, the orange hexes for the IMAP invasive records turned into these green presence, presence points. And they're overlaying many of those iNaturalist records um, are documented well in IMAP invasive. But you can see like there's this one anomaly, this one, um, you can see my point here just south of Dup Ferry. There's an iNaturalist record there. And if I click on it, it'll give me a little bit of information. And then if I click on details for that, then I can see more information about this iNaturalist record. And then to get even more information, which is what I highly recommend if you're looking at these anomalies, is actually go to the iNaturalist database itself where this record is coming from. And so that link that I showed you from IMAP is taking you directly to iNaturalist for that record. Um, you can see that this is. This is indeed Italian Arum. Um, a couple things about iNaturalist, if you're not familiar with it. So they use a term called research grade, and meaning that it has um, the proper uh, media to be able to identify it, like a photo and a location. Um, but it also has been um, agreed upon by two thirds of what they call the iNaturalist community in terms of its identification. And so, um, I will go into that a little bit more here down in the bottom, but before I go there, you can see this map on the side. Another thing I like to check on under the details there, if you expand that, that will give you a little bit of information about the accuracy of that location. So at this point, the GPS accuracy is about five meters, which I think is really good, but sometimes you'll see accuracies that are in thousands of meters. Um, so you do wanna check that if you're planning on, you know, following up on that observation. But as I scroll down, the activity center shows where the iNaturalist community has tried to come to an agreement on the identification of the species. And you can see there are um, a couple of different um, users, iNaturalist users, who have agreed with that. And so that's why this uh, particular record has reached what iNaturalist deems as research grade. And it must reach that research grade in order for it to be um, put into the IMAP invasive view of the data. So we're not bringing in records that have not reached that research grade threshold. All right, so going back to IMAP here, um, so just a couple of things about the data set that we're bringing in. So we're 
you know, essentially bringing in this view of iNaturalist data. And um, so this is, if I show you this little tab here with the iNaturalist data, it's the previous five years of research grade um, observations for species that are noted as invasive somewhere in the US or Canada. And so um, these are species on the IMAP invasive network wide list. There are a number of Canadian provinces and US states that are using IMAP. But that also means that you will be able to search and see species in, with this iNaturalist view that may be native to New York State. Because for example, uh, the bullfrog is native to New York State, but in Oregon, it's quite an invasive species. And so it is on the network list. So keep that in mind as you're using these uh, iNaturalist uh, features. And um, you can always, if I go over here to that little leaf with my menu um, button, there's a way to view the jurisdiction species list. So that's my New York state list. And then the, the full network species list, which has about 4,000 species, as opposed to about 500 species on our New York state list. All right. And also this, uh, the view of the data is refreshed about every week or two. We're getting this um, through um, what they call GBIS, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And so iNaturalist has to actually push their data to GBIS. And then once that is available, then we can put it into iMap. But just so you know, it's not an automatic connection. As soon as you enter something into iNaturalist, it will not show up in iMap. It'll, it'll take a couple of weeks after it reaches research grade agreement of the identification. All right, and then just a couple of other things to show you. We have um, included the iNaturalist data in the, the um, species list by geography report. So if I, um, you know, if I clear my filter and, you know, just show everything, of course that, can take a little while to spin. There's all the iNaturalist records for all the different species that um, we could consider. Um, and if I, you know, if I scroll up a little bit, maybe to the Dutchess County area, and I want to run a report, I can use this export report tool. Um, and there are help documents on this. And let's say I want to do a species list by geography. And I'm going to define my boundary. So I want to tell it what what geography do I want a species list for? I'm gonna pick my county and then I can click on the map and say, I want Dutchess County. Um, I want a species report for that. But there is a little quirk right here that we're all just kind of um, learning to deal with now. Um, it is a little unusual, but since it, the map extent zoomed out to show me that I you know, successfully selected Dutchess County, um, my iNaturalist, map layer turned off because now I am past the threshold of the zoom threshold of being able to see all species. So the trick is that we've learned you zoom back in. So I'm just going to zoom the map back in and I can see that Dutchess County is still selected because it's still on my thing. And then I hit the next tool and now I can run my report and um, these reports can take a little long to run. So I did cheat and I preloaded my um, my report output. And um, because it is a lot of data that is crunching, you can see that I the layers I had on for my report are the iNaturalist observations and the confirmed pre presences for iMath invasives. And we have these in separate tables. So the first rows of, um, of species are the iMath invasive presence records. And you can see over on the right hand side, this is the count of number of observations for that particular species. So if I zoom on down, sorry, I hope I don't give anyone a headache. Um, you can see there were 9,137 total records in Dutchess County within the IMAP and basis database. But now we have a section for the iNaturalist records. And we have that reminder um, that this may include species native to your jurisdiction. There is a link for a lot more details about the data set that we are capturing from iNaturalist. Um, so feel free to click on that and um, find out more. But so um, as I scroll down, um, you can see these are all the species that have popped up um, with the number of records for those iNaturalist um, records within Dutchess County. And once again, I'll zoom down to the bottom. 
Um, so we can see there are 4,696 iNaturalist records that are meeting that criteria that we've set up. All right. Great. So lots of good stuff. We also included the iNaturalist um, functionality within the email alert system. And this is this is not yet for all IMAP invasive users. It's rolling out, it's available to um, certain permission levels within IMAP invasives. So I think a lot of you on this call do have access to this. So when you go into your email alert, and I forgot this, yeah, you get to it from the map with that little menu button. Um, you click add edit alert. And um, typically when you want to add a new alert, it always says add a custom alert. You'll notice that there's now another option, which I'll get to in just a sec. So I'm going to hit add a custom alert. And let's call this the INAT and IMAP alert so my name for my alert and then you'll see that um, there are options of what types of data you want to include and iNaturalist records are grayed out if I hover over it it'll tell me that this option is only available when you're selecting weekly alert so the frequency needs to be set to weekly and now I have the ability to turn that on to iNaturalist to include iNaturalist records with that and so you can set your date and time you can set which species or all species and which location you want those alerts going out from or to trigger on. All right, so those are our typical alerts that people are most familiar with. Um, this is available um, to organizational admins and confirmers as well. Um, but the really new functionality um, is adding a horizon scanning alert. And this is only available right now to some organi to organizational admins and some other state level permissions that we assign. Um, so horizon scanning looks at um, the area that you've selected and um, then looks for species that are not yet in that, that area, but are in the surrounding, um, the surrounding area and new to the database. So if I say this is my horizon scanning alert, um, say for Albany County. Um, I will check, oops, I will select my county. I need to tell it that I'm in, I'm looking for a New York County list and go to Albany. And so now I can select whether I want the alert to just look at species that are um, on my New York state list versus I want to, I want it to trigger on species that are anywhere native, or I'm sorry, anywhere invasive within US or Canada. So which will include, of course, species native to your own jurisdiction. So it just depends on how wide of a net you want to um, you want to cast. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, this is from our development site, so it's um, there's still a little some little kinks that we're working out. But essentially, with if I had I had selected Albany County, and for that week when they had the the data run, um, there were eleven new iNaturalist records that um, are new species to that county, according to what's already in IMAP invasive. Um, there are 49 that were in a, a near buffer, so that's up to 25 miles, and then 448 that are in a far buffer, which is, um, oh, all right, thank you. Um, hold on just a sec, let me uh, share my other WebEx screen. Um, sharing, share, Aha. sorry, I was sharing in the application as opposed to my screen. All right, so here's an example output from, from test records of um, when we were testing this of my horizon scanning. And so this is looking for records within iNaturalist or IMAP that are not, not currently set to, um, to, um, be found within that county. And so um, we have 11 within geography, so within that county, 49 um, that are close to it, and then 448 that are far away from it. And so you have these different uh, sections as well. All right. And then I also had an example of the, the custom alert. So this is 
you know, a typical alert that I know a lot of you get. And, um, and it will show me that there are IMAP invasives records for Wineberry, but as I scroll down, there are also iNaturalist records. All right, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, so please enter any questions you have about iNaturalist into the chat box, and I'm going to get the PowerPoint going again, and then I will hand it off to Will. All right, thanks, Mitch. Hi, everyone. My name is Will McCall. I'm the GIS assistant with the New York Natural Heritage Program. And just to do a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about here today, I'm going to start with just a little background on the invasive species tiers. I'm going to talk about some updates I've made to the tier story map. And I'm also going to talk about the 2022 expert tiers that are now available from the 2021 IMAP data. And finally, I'm going to touch on the tier maps by PRISM that I've made that will be going live soon on the site. Um, so just so everyone's on the same page with the tier system, um, the invasive species tiers serve as a way to guide management priorities within each prism and across New York State. And it's specifically aimed at high impact invasive species. And so at tier one, it's species that are not present in a given region, but they're present in nearby regions or states. And this is the highest level of early detection survey efforts. In tier two, there are species that are present in small enough numbers that er eradication may still be feasible. And so this is the highest level of early detection efforts. Um, and then when we get into tiers three and tier four, that's when the species have much more established populations to the point where management efforts will be more costly and eradication is less feasible. So at tier three, containment is the primary focus. And at tier four, localized control and localized management efforts are the primary focus. And now these uh, invasive species tiers have evolved over the years into a data-driven standardized system. And you could view it as like a two-step system where in step one, we have the data tier and that's a million plus records from IMAP invasives, iNaturalist, USGS, NIS, and EBD maps. And then in step two, we have the expert tier um, where experts review the data tier and they formalize their own tiers based on the data combined with their specific localized knowledge. And the expert tier is what winds up in the invasive species tiers table. Um, and you can learn more about this at newyorkimapinvasive.org. Um, but I also want to point to everyone that we have this very helpful resource, the invasive species tiers story map. It's a really useful tool where you, that you can also find on the nyimapinvasives.org site. And it provides a very, a much more in-depth look at the invasive species tiers and the tiering process. Uh, it's created by Dylan Finley, who is a former ESF grad student who worked with New York Natural Heritage Program in 2020 and 2021. It's a really helpful resource. It provides you with these user-friendly, easy to navigate maps imagery and information detailing the tiers and the tiering process. And it has a lot of original artwork that Dylan made also. So it's informative, but it's also, it, it, it looks really good also. And I did just a few minor updates to it, just improving some of the navigation and fixing a few little things within it. Um, but again, that's, you can find more at the nyinfinvasives.org link. Um, but so going into the invasive species tiers updates, so the big update is that we have the 2022 expert tiers completed for many of the prisms, and that's now available on the tiers table. And these expert tiers are based on 2021 field data. And we wanna stress that this is not based on the 2022 field data, it's based on the 2021 field data. Um, and that's because creating and developing these tiers is a intensive process, it takes time. Um, so, in 2023, the expert tiers will be based on the 2022 field data, but the newest expert tiers we have are based on the 21 field data. We just want to make that clear. Um, but so just to show you how to navigate to the tiers table from the nyimapinvasives.org homepage. So this is the homepage right here. What you want to do is you want to hover your mouse over the data and maps option, and then there will be a pop-up menu down here. And you want to click on species tiers and prioritization. 
when you click on that, that's going to bring you to the prioritization analysis section. And then just click on tiers table right here, and that'll bring you to the tiers table. So this is what the tiers table looks like. Um, and before we get into it, I just want to stress it's really useful at the top of the tiers table. There's an overview section and uh, there's a lot of information that can just help you more fully understand the power within the table and more effectively navigate and own the data that you're looking for. Um, so give a read to that. It only takes, you know, it's like eight sentences, eight sentences I counted. So it doesn't take too long to read. Um, but so within the tiers table itself, beyond having the updated expert data, there are a couple of new features within the table also. Um, so we added a regulatory status column. So it'll tell you if a species has a regulatory status within New York and what that regulatory status is. And then on top of that, we added this toggle function where you can change the filters between being in any selected geography versus in all selected geographies. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more in a couple slides, but just to go over the filter tools themselves. Um, so there are several filters within the tiers table that you can uh, put the data through to further hone what you're looking for. So first we have the geography filter where you can sort by prism or through uh, statewide tiers. Then we have the taxa, which you can filter whether it's a terrestrial or aquatic species, whether it's an animal or a plant or a microorganism. And finally, we also have the tiers themselves. Um, and so once we have that, I'm just gonna give you a little quick demo on how to use a filter. So let's say for this example, we're going to look at only the APIP geography. We're gonna look at terrestrial plants and we're gonna look at tier two species. And as you can see here, we have eight entries within APIP that are tier two species and terrestrial plants. And so once you have uh, your table, you can do a lot of different sorting within the table. So you can use the columns and sort them alphabetically or numerically, depending on what the data is within each column. You can also, if you have a lot of data, you can use the search bar here to search for whatever it is you're looking for, if you have a keyword in mind. And also uh, under the common names, these are all hyperlinks. So you can click on each of these common names and you can go directly to uh, the species. The IMAP will be filtered for that species. Um, so I'm gonna show off also the uh, any selected geography versus all selected geographies tool. Um, so for this demo, I'm gonna, again, we're gonna use select all geographies for the geography. Um, we're going to use uh, the terrestrial plant taxa and I'm gonna look at tier two species. And so we're filtering this for any uh, geography that may have these criteria. And we have 105 entries within that. So that means that there's 105 tier two terrestrial plant species within one of the criteria, whether it's statewide or one of the prisms. And now I'm going to show you we can do the same thing, except we're going to use uh, all selected geographies rather than any selected geographies. So under this category, it would have to be tier two species that are terrestrial plants, and they are tier two terrestrial plants in all of the geographies. And as you can see here, that's a very specific uh, thing that we'd be looking for, and there are no entries that fit all of that. Uh, but it's helpful to be able to switch between those two, and we just added that toggle of any versus all geographies. Um, and so that is all I have for the tier tables themselves, but I have one more thing I want to show you about tier maps by prism that I helped make. And so this is coming soon. It's not available yet, but it will be available on the IMAP interface and uh, it'll be likely linked to from the tiers table. But so what this is, is there will be links that open up on IMAP filtered to the list of species within that tier. So essentially, if you wanted to see tier four species within the Finger Lakes region, you could click here, or tier three within Lower Hudson, you could click here. Um, and for the purpose of this demo, let's look at tier two species within the capital region prism. So you would just click right here, and it would take you to a filtered map where these are only tier two species within the capital region prism. And you can do the same thing where you, this is what the tier three species would look like within the capital region prism, and here's tier four. And uh, so we do also want to mention as you go further up into the tiers, there's more species. So that means more data. It'll take more time to load. So be patient. 
Um, but that is, we're excited about that. And this is coming soon. It's not up live yet, but it, it will be available soon. And so just wrapping up on my end, this whole process we have here is repeated annually. Um, so like I said, it will be rerun with all 2022 field data in early 2023 to create the 2023 expert tiers. Um, and therefore it's really important for everyone to get their data into IMAP by the end of each year so we can create more accurate species tiers and develop more effective management plans. Um, so it's particularly important for high priority data tiers. It's particularly important for high priority data tiers like tier one and tier two to get that data in as soon as you can. And additionally, underreported data is extremely helpful. So we have a spreadsheet right here. This is just a snippet from the spreadsheet of selected species that were listed as underreported by experts within each prism. And uh, so just wrapping up with all these tools that we're developing, the better the data is in IMAP, the more useful it will be for all of you guys who are working on invasive species projects. And so uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Meg now uh, for additional updates. Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, everything we've talked about today does come back to user feedback and iterative and collaborative work. So we really appreciate, um, and I'll say it again at the end, uh, and Mitch already mentioned it, you know, user feedback, participation in work groups, all super important. And, you know, that drive I'm at. A couple things I'm going to cover, one place where we need your help and one place where we think we've given you some help <laughs> and a couple of things that are coming for the organization admins. So the place where we need your help, um, this is a list of what we call common species. So everyone may have a varying opinion of what species might be listed as common, but in IMAP software, we have set 13 species to be official common species. And um, this is the 2022 data for just the confirmed data for just those 13 species. And if you look, we have a bunch more that need confirming. <laughs> um, so if you are interested in helping to confirm, uh, and you can pick one or two species, you don't have to help with the species you're not comfortable with. But if there are a couple of these species that you would be help, um, comfortable helping with, please email the IMAP box and Mitch will get directions to you about how to become a confirmer for Tom. Now, the second thing is, this is kind of funny because um, we had several people like, I can't find that video that was on how to set up the IMAP mobile app. And um, sometimes we would go to each other. I know we made a PDF about how to use the filter tool and I can't find it. So we now have a super cool searchable um, health resources library. So again, from the IMAP um, homepage, if you pick the uh, IMAP resources library, it will go out to this interface that is searchable and has all it's a treasure trove it has pdfs it has um recorded videos it has species information it has information on the imap mobile advanced tool the imap mobile app um, but i picked one to show here quickly is for people who are new to imap if you select that particular one it will give you specifically a list of videos and PDFs um, that we recommend for getting started with IMAP. The third thing I'm gonna mention is um, some new advanced functionality that will be coming for organization administrators. So you've heard us say this two or three times, <laughs> org admins. Um, some of you may remember within IMAP, there is a, a group organization so, uh, for instance, Ag and Markets is an organization, and Parks is an organization, and the Prism, you know, Western New York Prism staff is an organization. And within those organizations, 
there is a user that is the organization admin, and that person always has extra power. So these two things are not available yet, but I encourage everyone to look at their account, see who their organization is, and make sure that's the right organization for you. And then, um, you know, if, for instance, uh, you're with a state agency, look and see who is the org admin and is that the right um, person to be the org admin. And if it is, then reach out to them and let them know this stuff is coming. And if it's not, reach out to us and we can update to a user that is the correct person to be your organization admin. So the two things that are coming for the org admin or organization administrators is <laughs> um, one is the Horizon Scanning Email Alert, which Jen already mentioned a little bit. Uh, it, it is weekly. It can include IMAP and iNaturalist data. It's to help look for things on the horizon. So you pick a specific geography, and here I picked Schenectady County, but you could pick a prism or a town. Um, and then it will look for new species, um, um, new species in the near horizon. And then also, um, that's a 25 mile distance, and then new species in the far horizon, which is 100 miles. So it, it helps you look at what might be coming and have it on your search image um, radar and be aware to be looking for. And the other thing that also was greatly requested by users, that all of the iNaturalist stuff was certainly requested by users. Um, the other thing requested by the organization admin was the batch edit tool to be able to have the power to edit many records with them. All right, and then just reiterating, um, again, iterative and collaborative, and all of these things have evolved um, because users requested them, um, many users. <laughs> um, and I do always encourage people to send us suggestions. I also like to always put the caveat on that we do have limited resources, as everyone does. And so we certainly cannot do all the suggestions we receive. But it is, you know, when we get the seventh request or the 17th request for something, we're like, hey, <laughs> this should go near the top of the pile. So um, with that, I say again, thank you to the group and pass it back to Mitch. Thank you. Thanks, Meg, and thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, I know we just hit our one hour mark, so I know we might lose people, but we are wrapping up now. So I'm going to close with some uh, calendar things to put on your calendar. Um, so next month uh, is the PRISM call is going to happen again, like it did this morning. So there's going to be an 11 a.m. call, like there is every month, um, and the topic will be on the um, aquatic invasive species, ponds, and lakes vulnerability prioritization for New York State, um, which we were a part of developing. And so we'll have our colleagues, Tim Howard and Dane Conley, on that webinar presenting uh, the background of the model and that sort of stuff. And as a follow up, our monthly webinar for October is going to be a workshop on how to use the online tool that came out of that. Um, so Feel free to go to our website for more information on that. Um, also, in November, there's going to be the CCE in service, and that's not an event we're putting on, but I'll explain why we're promoting that here in a second. Um, and then November 30th, our next 1 p.m. Uh, Wednesday monthly webinar is going to be about documenting uh, post treatment effectiveness, and we'll hear from Fate Saiwang Nuan from uh, SUNY ESF on that work. And so for the in-service, I just wanted to put a plug for one session in the Invasive Species Track of the in-service. It's going to be focused on uh, prioritization tools. So keep an eye out for that and go to that website for more information. And with that, I thank everyone so much for joining, and I thank all of our presenters.